Acts of terrorism done in the name of Islam do not equate to acts condoned by Islam Part 1. Islam and the overwhelming majority of Muslims are free from the barbarous acts perpetrated in Paris by ISIS. Any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people. Since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. al maida 32 Due to Cain's murder of his brother. I informed the Israelites that any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people, since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. Whoever refrains from killing a person whose soul I have made sacred, and regards it to be forbidden to kill such a person, it is as if he has given life to all people. Because in such an action lies the safety of all people. My messengers brought to the Israelites clear signs and evidences. Despite this many of them overstepped my limits by committing sins and going against the messengers, al Maida 32. ISIS, a scourge on humanity. The, Islamic State, ISIS, which is in a sorry state far from Islam. Released a self-congratulating public statement claiming responsibility for a coordinated wave of attacks that took place in Paris on November 13, 2015, leaving 129 innocent people dead. These barbaric and inhumane acts were committed in the name of Allah and the name of Islam by a marginalized sect of cult-minded radicals who share ideology with a deviant Muslim sect that has been the bane of Muslims' existence for over 1,400 years, the first Muslim leader to fight against this deviant sect and subdue their evil was the fourth caliph of the Muslim world, Ali ibn Abi Talib. This group, which has illegitimately appropriated for itself the name, Islamic State, is an offshoot, Ayyub as Saktians said, the Khawarij may differ in their names but they are united on shedding blood with the sword. Nowadays, the word, sword, serves as a generic noun for guns bombs or any other device used by this cult for shedding blood, of a notorious sect, historically known as al khwarij the renegades. Who were the first sect to break away from mainstream Islam, this sect has three main characteristics when it comes to hurting all of its offshoots together. Sheikh Sali al-Fazan said that they, the Khawari, 1, excommunicate other Muslims, 2, renounce any obedience to the leaders or governments and, 3, declare the blood of Muslims lawful to spill. This sect has a well-documented, inglorious history of snuffing out innocent life with impunity. Not a single century has passed in the Islamic world except that this sect has left in its wake death, destruction and mayhem. So conspicuous is this group's notoriety that the Prophet, himself named this sect, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, the Khawarij are the dogs of hell. Sahih Ibn Majah. And made some sobering statements regarding it. The Prophet, said, they, the Khawarij, are the worst amongst creation and creatures. Sahih. Muslim. However, despite this sect's notoriety throughout the ages, the majority of Muslims, especially nowadays, are ignorant of this sect and its traits. Which may go a long way in answering why some Muslims fall prey to ISIS propaganda. Another reason why Muslims fall prey to ISIS propaganda can be outlined in the words of the Prophet himself. During the last days, there will appear a young people with foolish dreams. They will speak with the best of rhetoric among creation, but they will exit from Islam as an arrow exits from its game, and their faith will not exceed their throats. Sahih Bukhari Why would anyone want to join a group that specializes in mass murder abductions, Imam Ibn Baz on hijacking planes and kidnapping? From that which is known to everyone who has the slightest bit of common sense is that hijacking airplanes and kidnapping children and the like are extremely great crimes, the world over. Their evil effects are far and wide, as is the great harm and inconvenience caused to the innocent, the total effect of which none can comprehend except Allah. Likewise, from that which is known is that these crimes are not specific to any particular country over and above another country, nor any specific group over and above another group. Rather it encompasses the whole world. And has a and has a carnivorous appetite for destruction unless it's got something to offer, even if that something is a mirage of words? 
Islam explicitly forbids the harming of innocent people in any way whatsoever, no matter if that harm is physical, emotional, or psychological in nature. The Prophet said. There should be neither harming nor reciprocating harm. Sunan Ibn Majah This statement from the Prophet serves as a pivotal principle in the legal system of Islam. And as a result, it is not permissible to harm or kill a non-Muslim who is not hostile or has a peace treaty with the Muslims. Contrary to ISIS's ill-gotten standpoint, Islam is not opposed to showing kindness and justice to non-Muslims, as proven by the following verse. Allah does not prohibit you from those who have not fought you on account of your Islam, and who have not expelled you from your homes. That you be good and fair to them by giving them any right they have against you. An example of this is how Asma bint Abu Bakr al-Siddiq behaved with her disbelieving mother when she came to visit her after she had taken permission from the Prophet, peace be upon him, for this end. He instructed her to join family ties. Allah loves those who are just to themselves, their families and what they are in charge of. al mumtahana 8 ISIS, on the other hand, acts as if this verse wasn't revealed and that Islam's purpose and objective is to exterminate non-Muslims like vermin. Anyone who possesses sight can see that ISIS and Islam are mutually exclusive in their objectives. Perpetrating crimes in the name of a particular religion does not necessitate that said religion advocates or even condone such vile, criminal activity. A single soul is equal to all souls and a life is taken unjustly. At the start of this paper, we quoted a verse that expresses the Islamic attitude when it comes to taking life without any legal precedent. The verse states, Any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people. Since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. al maida 32 This verse eloquently illustrates to us the sanctity of human life and the magnitude of the crime of taking just one life. This verse equates the taking of one life to all life, and this is not just a symbolic gesture. The scholars of Islam state that equating one life to all life is because when a person takes a life unjustly he has arbitrarily set a precedent to take any life unjustly. Because what would be the preventing factor in not taking life when life isn't held as sacred or there is little regard for law that protects life? And in this way, a single soul becomes representative of all souls because all souls are intrinsically sacred, but the seal of sacredness is removed when just one life is taken unjustly. This is the Islamic attitude towards all human life and, obviously, it is an attitude that is not shared by the murderous cult, Isis. Allah states in another verse. And do not kill anyone whom Allah has forbidden, except for a just cause. Al-Isra 33. Do not kill the soul whose life Allah has protected through faith or a pledge of security, except if the killing is merited on the basis of treason or legal retribution. If someone is killed unjustly, without a valid reason permitting his being killed, I have given his successor who takes charge of his affairs certain authority over the killer. He may demand that the killer be killed in retribution, or he may forgive him without asking for anything in return, or he may forgive him and take the blood money. But he shall not mutilate the killer, or by killing him with something that he did not use to kill, or by killing someone other than the killer, even if he was a helper and supporter. Al-Isra 33 So, Allah has forbidden the killing of anyone except for a just cause, i.e., a legal precedent. Thus, the underlying principle is that all life is sacred unless there is a legal precedent that provides an exception to the underlying rule. However, ISIS have an inverted and perverted take on this principle of Islam and humanity that states, no life is sacred, including Muslim life. Because ISIS is a just cause. Not only does ISIS violate the sanctity of human life but they also violate the sanctity of Allah's laws, despite Allah stating. But do not transgress the limits. Truly, Allah likes not the transgressors. Al-Baqarah 190 Fight in order to raise the word of Allah, against those of the disbelievers who fight you to turn you away from the religion of Allah. But do not overstep the limits of Allah by killing children, women, the elderly, or by mutilating the dead and so on. Allah does not love those who overstep the limits he has established and made sacred. 
Al-Baqarah 190 Islam's Rules of Engagement During War Islam has rules of engagement that the Muslims must adhere to during wars that are fought for a just cause. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, who was the first caliph of Islam to succeed the Prophet Muhammad, gave strict instructions to Muslim armies prior to engaging in warfare. He instructed Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan with the following before being dispatched to Sham. Do not kill women or children or an aged, infirm person. Do not cut down fruit-bearing trees. Do not destroy an inhabited place. Do not slaughter sheep or camels except for food. Do not burn bees and do not scatter them. Do not steal from the booty, and do not be cowardly. Al-Bihaki in al kabr Once again, ISIS set of perverted protocols are a constant contradiction of these instructions given by a real caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr as siddiq this statement by Abu Bakr as siddiq is preceded by similar statements from Prophet Muhammad. But we won't mention them here because we wish to save them for a later section of this paper to drive home a valuable point. ISIS cult policy, you are either with US or against US. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, for they, the Karajites, strive to kill every Muslim who did not agree with their view, declaring the blood of the Muslims, their wealth and the slaying of their children to be lawful, while excommunicating them. And they considered this to be worship, due to their ignorance and their innovation which caused, them, to stray. Translation taken the Karajites. Historical Roots of the Ideology of Extremism and Terrorism Be under no illusion, ISIS, being the cult it is, only exists for itself and not for the collective well-being of the Muslims, in spite of its self-righteous rhetoric. The ISIS atrocities that non-Muslims have been recently subjected to in France are similar to the ISIS atrocities that are committed in Muslim lands. Syria has seen hundreds of horrific terrorist atrocities similar to the Paris attacks, committed by Western-backed Muslim militias, since 2011 in their attempts to topple over the Assad regime. Hundreds of suicide bombings have been carried out in Syria. In February 2013, a series of bombings in the capital Damascus killed more than 80 and injured at least 250 others on February 21. A massive car bomb exploded close to the offices of the Syrian Baidh party, killing 59 and injuring more than 200 others. Among the other most notorious suicide attacks carried out by Islamist forces are included the December 2011 Damascus bombing, killing 44 people and injuring 166 and the May 2012 Damascus attack that killed 55 and injured 400. We do not make this observation to undermine the horrific events that took place in France. Rather, we make this observation for two reasons. One, to remind people in the West, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that the unadulterated wickedness that has been unleashed by this bloodthirsty cult is nothing new when Muslims around the world are taken into consideration. Atabari reported, the Kawarij came to a village and they seized a man and his daughter. She said to them, O people of Islam. Indeed, my father is an old man so do not kill him, and I am only a girl. By Allah, I have never been immoral and I have never harmed anyone. They brought her to kill her and she kept saying, what is my sin? What is my sin? Then she fainted and they killed her with their swords. Tariq al-Tabari 1512, translation taken from. What we disturbingly witnessed in Paris is a continuation of what Muslims have witnessed, and still witness, for over 1,400 years. What we are highlighting here is that both Muslims and non-Muslims alike are plagued by this scourge on humanity. However, if history teaches us anything, it will teach us that Muslims have always been the victims of this brutal sect and its offshoots. This should teach, or remind, us that ISIS have very little regard for life, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless such life unconditionally surrenders to ISIS ideology. Which is nothing more than a brutal cult mentality that leeches off Islam to sustain its religious and moral justification for snuffing out life with impunity. 2. Because Muslims around the world in various Muslim countries have systematically suffered similar atrocities to those that took place in Paris. This allows the Muslims and non-Muslims to uniquely empathize with each other, and not merely sympathize. Due to their shared nightmarish experiences at the hands of these murderers who make little distinction between Muslim and non-Muslim life. 
If the above is true, which it is, this should cause us to realize that this is not a war between Islam and the West or Muslims and non-Muslims. Rather, this is a war between two groups of well-organized zealots with their own religious and political agendas in play. On one side of the spectrum of extremism, we have ISIS who are hell-bent on destabilizing planet Earth, and on the spectrum of extremism, we have ISIS who are hell-bent on destabilizing planet Earth. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have Western foreign policy that meddles in other people's affairs on the pretext of bringing freedom to the Muslims when the reality couldn't be any further from the truth. This is creating a vicious vortex that is drawing into its powerful current everything around it. If it looks like a Muslim. This subheading is a play on the duck test, which is used to identify, and ultimately pass judgment on, something by merely observing the subject's characteristics and actions. Sometimes the duck test is a process of pure logical inference, while, on other occasions, it serves as a convenient mechanism to desperately label something to impart blame on that something. And thus, when atrocities are committed by Muslims, and emotions are running high, we hear, if it looks like a Muslim, talks like a Muslim and acts like a Muslim then it probably is a, true, Muslim, I see acting according to the dictates of Islam. Non-Muslims, suffering from a bout of Islamophobia, very quickly. Single out Islam and all Muslims for unmerited attention, simply because scapegoating demands a sacrifice at the altar of vengeance. Muslim woman slashed with box cutter as race hate crime spiral after Paris attacks. And vengeance, being vengeance, has little interest in distinguishing between a bad Muslim who clashes with the very teachings of Islam and a good Muslim who correctly embodies the message of Islam. The irony here is that ISIS have their own version of the duck test. If it looks like a kafir, talks like a kafir and acts like a kafir then it probably is a, true, kafir, i.e. going to the hellfire forever, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. Thus, even though both groups have a mutual hatred for each other, they strangely share a common, superficial outlook of each other. Nothing keeps viciousness in a circular motion quite like mutually ill-conceived notions of each other. Emotionally charged terminology that further exacerbates matters. Many Muslims, let alone non-Muslims, have a hard time not seeing these savage terrorists as fighting for the Islamic cause due to a constant onslaught of buzzwords used in the media. Like Islamists or Islamic terrorists. Then we have these terrorist thugs employing their own terms of grandeur, like the Islamic State and the Khilafah, which romanticize and glamorize their ignoble, doomed to fail cause. Even the phrase, Muslim terrorist, is mutually exclusive on a connotative level because when a person submits to the teachings of Islam, he will naturally develop an aversion to all forms of injustice, including terrorism. Allah states, O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses injustice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness. al maida 8 O oh, you who believe in Allah and His Messenger and follow His laws, uphold Allah's rights over you, seeking His pleasure. Be witnesses for justice and not for oppression. The hatred for a people should not make you leave justice, Justice is a requirement with a friend, as well as with an enemy, so be just with both. Justice is closer to the fear of Allah, and oppression is closer to disrespect against Him. Be mindful of Allah by fulfilling His instructions and avoiding His prohibitions. Allah knows what you do. Nothing of your actions is hidden from Him and He will repay you accordingly. al maida 8 this verse, alone, teaches us that Islam requires all Muslims to persistently stand out for justice. Even when our rights have been violated and our hatred is running rampant, we are still required to stand out for justice and do what's right. Since, if we allow our emotions to get the better of us then vengeance and retribution seem no different to justice and that's when injustice can flourish. For further reading on the consequences of allowing one's hatred to dictate matters. It could be said that we tolerate the phrase, Muslim terrorist. Because, one, these terrorists themselves identify, in word and not deed, with Islam and, two, because doing sinful acts doesn't disqualify them from being Muslims. 
there is a scholarly difference of opinion on whether the Khawarij are deviant Muslims or outside the fold of Islam. Putting aside their true state of affairs, the very fact that the scholars of Islam dispute the validity of their Islam is enough to show us how evil this sect is. It just disqualifies them from being law-abiding Muslims who implements the teachings of Islam correctly. In any case, the task of separating ISIS from Islam and the overwhelming majority of Muslims becomes nigh on impossible thanks to ISIS' embezzlement of Islamic terminology and the media frenzy with connecting every terrorist atrocity to Islam and the Muslims. But let's not despair too much because those who want to see, will see, and those who don't, will not see, no matter how much we magnify the letters TRUTH.